All right, guys, we made it here to the Argo Gold Mine and Mill where they do tours. So we're gonna go in. Hopefully they're doing tours. It just started raining, but hopefully that's not gonna affect maybe the mine tour. But we're really excited about this place. And it just looks fascinating as, as can be. And just looking in the gate right here, I'm seeing all kind of cool machinery already. There's a big press right here, a Chambersburg. I'm seeing a Kennedy Auto drill press over there. Looks like a steam engine or hit and miss engine. All kinds of old machinery up in there. So we're excited to go and see what this place is all about. This is gonna be fun, fascinating. And one of the cool, uh, interesting facts about this place is that it's estimated $3 billion worth of gold ore has been taken out of this place. Did you say billion or trillion? I, said, I did say billion, but I meant to say trillion. Yeah. That's what it said, three trillion estimated in gold ore. That's pretty amazing. So let's go check it out. Ah, uh, look at all the rusty gold everywhere. Yes. All right, so the great news is that we do get the tour. Probably in about 15 minutes we start the tour and it's going to be about an hour hour and a half long tour and i asked the guy if there was any machine shop equipment still up there and they said back in the 1940s whenever that was when they originally uh, closed down and abandoned the mine uh, because of a, a water pressure accident that happened there um, they had taken a lot of the original machine shop equipment out of the mine then but since then they brought in a lot of different stuff uh, for this right here to show so there's going to be a lot of different interesting things to film and share with you on video, I think. So pretty excited about that. While we're waiting, I'm just going to kind of walk through here and see some of the old rusty gold. This must have been a lot of the original equipment, machines, and tooling from the mine. Uh, with, without asking them, I don't know. Some of this might have been brought in from other mines in the area. There was a couple machines. Let's check those out. This is a this is an old drill press. This is an old radio alarm drill press made by Kennedy Auto. You see it right here. That is neat. <clears throat> the old drill press that we had at the shop that I ended up selling to Fred was Kennedy Auto. This is Joshua Hendy Ironworks, San Francisco, California. This would have been belt driven, yes. Like a flat belt. Right. And then this is the flywheels right here. Pretty cool. Oh, I see something else. There's a big grinder right over here. Man, look at that. Rock bit grinder. Masco rock bit grinder. No, you can't probably can't see that. There you go. The Mine and Smelter Supply Company. How cool is that tag right there? <clears throat> and then this one underneath there, Timken Bearing Equipped. Nice. This is that Chambersburg. Look how massive this is right here. Solid. But I'm not sure exactly what it is. It looks like a press. It's what it looks like to me is a press. This is another one of those machines like we saw down there. Just a different make. Aurora Rock Crusher. Well, maybe that's what it is crushes rocks yeah. this says aurora rock crusher on it because this is built just like that other one that we saw right down there yeah. that's cool really neat looking abby spotted the uh, wilton vice over here <laughs> And it doesn't work. It's missing some pieces right here. Tradesman. 
Model 1750. All right, we're starting the tour now. <laughs> you see the, uh, the Safeway? That's how far the water shot out of the tunnel whenever the accident occurred. There it is, there's the portal. Did you see it? What, it's over there. Yeah, that's the portal for it. They said there's an Ingr Ingersoll ran uh, piston compressor in here we're going to check out. So the leather belt would wrap around the flywheel. As the flywheel spun, it would push pistons alternating towards the heads. This larger port on the side of the heads, that was used for ventilation. Now it was 4.2 miles of tunnel itself, but almost 200 miles of connected mines all requiring ventilation as well. While these smaller ports would provide higher pressure air that would be connected to hoses. Those hoses would run up and branch out to the 45 connected mines, providing pneumatic air power for the use of their rock drilling equipment. So everybody has a hard hat on, we're ready to go. Who wants to go underground? Yeah. This is where a second one was that was taken out during the war effort whenever they were removing equipment for uh, steel. All right, well, it looks like we do get to go into the, the tunnel. Look how cute you are with your hair on. <laughs> they haven't seen me with my hard hat on. Styling. How do I look? You look great. You make everything look great. You can hear the water coming out of it. Wow. So you guys probably remember this here from the video. This is not water draining out of the Argo. This is coming from two separate mining groups in the area. The EPA simply redirected this water over here so it can be processed in the same location. Now this water on the left is the least acidic, around 4.2 pH. You can see there's even algae growing on that side. This water on the right is more acidic, around 3.5. That's not where the red That's the water treatment plant right over there. Beautiful. <laughs> this is great. Wow. That is just cool being in here. reinforcement and through these black pipes around the circumference they injected an extremely high pressure concrete this door is capable of withstanding tremendous amounts of water pressure a lot more than the mere 100,000 gallons that's currently behind it <clears throat> so how much water would be in there right now if you would if you was to be able to look in there it's only actually about 4.7 feet but okay. it's such a gradual incline going back it adds up to a lot a lot of water about 100,000 gallons Okay, and this is consistent all the way through the all the way through the tunnel. So it does get shallower as you go back because uh, it does raise uh, elevation throughout the land. Okay. So that way it's naturally draining down. Uh, but there's a lot of connected tunnels yeah. in the sides that also fill up water. Yeah. Okay. It's cool, man. It's interesting. They did a good job on this.
And you guys might notice the pieces of rebar sticking out of the ceiling. That stuff is there for a reason. Essentially, as cracks form along the tops of these mines and tunnels, something you might find interesting. This concrete here is actually original from 1883. Oh, cool. It's been layered over a couple of times, but at its core, it's original. You can even see all the little stones that they used to put in there. Actually, that was the only way that concrete used to be able to bond. Very neat, man. I was going to ask you, what were the, the pipes that stick them through the concrete? What was that? What are so those pipes for? Those were injection ports for high pressure concrete. Okay. So essentially, they built two walls, put those, installed those pipes in, and then installed the rebar. And then they got some sort of machine to pump in high pressure concrete. And once that's wow. set, this is basically is about as strong as a wall at the yeah. yeah. Cool. When was that? When was that built? Pretty recently, uh, August of 2015. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not not that old. And so this is all the water that's coming out of the Argo yep. tunnel. And this is it right here. And they send it over to the uh, water treatment plant there. Yep. And they process around 200,000 gallons per day. And out of that 200,000 gallons, they get two to three tons of metallic sludge. Normally would have been going into Clear Creek. Okay. What do they do with the sludge? They actually have to ship it up to Erie, Pennsylvania via truck. Really? It's the only place in the nation that they're going to be able to dump that material. Okay. ton rot or storage bin, those portholes would have had connected hopper systems simply to feed the rock down onto these concrete pedestals. On each of these pedestals you had 10 steel plates, so 20 in total. And above each of those plates was a 1,000 pound metal hammerhead connected to a 1,500 pound metal rod with a 4 to 500 pound collar fixed near the top. That's 3,000 pounds per hammer with 20 of those in total adds up to 60,000 pounds of steel being operated by just two AC electric motors. You can see the remnants of one right over there. And each of those motors would have had a leather belt wrapped around a perpendicular rod brand new in color. So of all these hammers, you'd have two lobes per collar. So as it rotated, so you have a better idea for just how big this machine really was. Give a picture of another stand. Mill feed bin. That board would have been equivalent to more than halfway up with the metal rod sitting out. Now, this working model, of course, we didn't place. This is a, just a little model of the uh, rock hammers that were in place here on these two foundations. He was telling us how loud this was, that you could hear it 20 miles east and 20 miles west. It was so loud. It's gorgeous. There's an original a photograph in this building right here. There's the coal forge there. Oh yeah, we're getting down into the good stuff over there. <laughs> now we're getting down into some machinery. Flat belt. Love seeing the old equipment still in place. The big pulleys. They got the big bevel gears. 
the mixture tank. You can see the prop down there. That line shaft going across there. That's part of an old electric motor right there. <clears throat> so a really good opportunity for the mixture is it's standing anywhere at the base of these stairs. If you look up into the mill, you can identify how big this place is. We also have our original fuse boxes up here on the wall. Those were installed in 1913. And it just keeps on going, huh? Make it at 120th the overall material. This is also older than anything we have at the Argo. This is from a milling operation out of Leadville. This would have been made in about 1860. Now at the time, they didn't have access to many different types of trees. They didn't have access to bristlecone pines. That's what this thing is made out of. Bristlecones take an extremely long time to grow. It can take up to a century for them to add a single inch of girt. Based on the size of these plants, which again are bristlecone, these trees were over 2,000 years old and they were cut down back in 1860. This thing would have operated in the creek for 30 years, 1860 through 1890. The constant flow of water from the creek would keep the crush door moving while the water wheel would be attached right here to actually power the machine. This thing has been outside its entire life. It's pushing 160 years old. You can see this nut here still fresh, no problem. The door was nice. Alright, now I'm done with the fun. So I'll get you guys going on the gold canning. If you guys want to go to one of those cover drops there, I'll go ahead and show you exactly how to get gold out of your van. That was awesome. This is a really cool spot right here. These kind of places are always so fun to explore and see. It's got an amazing history to it. I think we're going to go ahead and close out this video right here and uh, they're going to do some gold panning over there but i think we're going to hit the road and we're going to estes park i think that's our next journey plus it's starting to rain pretty heavy out here yeah. but this was a really cool place to see and uh, learn about it's got an amazing amount of history to it um, they produce more gold and um, they, they produce more gold here than any other mine in the world i believe he said at 95 percent efficiency that's, that's what incredible. was that's what was really amazing about this place. But definitely something cool to see if you ever come through uh, Idaho Springs on uh, Interstate 70 here in Colorado. We enjoyed our time. Hope you guys enjoyed the video from what I could share with you. And uh, see you on the next adventure.